U.S. science policy and any lessons from uh, Europe. Uh, we have um, a big crowd, which is a bit un unusual uh, because it's Easter uh, period. And it's also unusual in the sense that it's in terms of age structure. <laughs> um, so let me explain a bit. So the, the high number of young people in this area are uh, all honors students from uh, the University of Leuven who are uh, uh, selected to, uh, to be exposed to a Brussels event. <laughs> Uh, to see how, how this actually works uh, here. So I hope the students will also be very active in the, in the actual discussion uh, here. But there are also other <laughs> participants uh, here because I think the topic that we are discussing today is a very uh, important topic. Uh, science policy uh, belongs to, to general uh, drivers of growth that we urgently need uh, both in Europe uh, but also over the world. And innovation policy is very often, and innovation is very often seen as a driver uh, of growth uh, here. And for innovation, science policy might, and, and science uh, will be an important driver. That's very often claimed, but the question is uh, how effective is it uh, and what kind of conditions do we actually need for science to, to be really this growth driver that we are expecting from that. Usually when we talk about this in Europe, uh, it's not so easy to defend science policy as a driver of growth and particularly to get public budgets for this, particularly in terms of uh, high fiscal austerity. Um, and then we very often turn to the US as an example of where everything works perfectly <laughs> and where it's uh, science is, is really an important driver and the funding of science is perfect uh, here. So that's why we actually wanted to, to really um, take a more evidence-based perspective of this. Is it indeed the case that US science policy is so much better <laughs> and, and that funding for US uh, science is so much easier than in Europe uh, here? And that's why we're very happy that we have uh, Jeff Furman uh, today. Uh, who will talk about, indeed, U.S. science policy. Um, Jeff Furman uh, got his uh, PhD from uh, MIT, Sloan School of Management. He's uh, currently an associate professor of strategy and innovation at Boston University. He's also a research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic uh, Research, which is a very prestigious uh, um, bureau. Uh, he has published in, 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 in very important uh, journals like the American Economic Review. Uh, his research is indeed around international business innovation, uh, science-based firms, cumulative uh, innovation. Um, his most important contribution, which I think many of, particularly many of the students will know, is, is a paper together with Michael Porter and Scott Stern on the determinants of national innovation capacity, which is a very highly cited uh, contribution to the field. Uh, he also co-organizes the Summer School of NBR on innovation policy and the economy, so he's very well placed to, to have a look at, at policy issues uh, here. Uh, so the floor is first for, for Jeff uh, for about half an hour. Um, Maximally, and then we will um, go to the discussions, and I will introduce the discussions each at uh, at a time, so that you don't have to remember all the details of the discussion. So, Jeff, are you ready? Yes. So, um, thank you very much, uh, everyone, for coming. Thank you very much, Br uh, Bruegel, for uh, inviting me. It's an honor to be here uh, with you yeah, in uh, in um, in Brussels, and I'm going to talk about uh, one particular area of American science policy. Uh, and science and innovation policy called the America Competes Act. And the America Competes Act was introduced with great fanfare, and I'm sad to say that the fanfare has not been realized in actual policy outcomes. Um, so that's, that's sort of the, the, the main punchline. Here, here's a bit of the outline um, uh, for my talk today. I'll talk about what the America Competes Act is and was, and I'll make some arguments for why it's an important thing to study. I'll talk a little bit about the history of science and innovation funding in the United States, perhaps back further than any of us would really like to, uh, to examine today. And then I'll talk about the three efforts at the America Competes Act, the first of which was introduced in 2007 when uh, George Bush uh, was president, the second of which was introduced in 2010 when Barack Obama was president, and the third of which was attempted to be introduced last year, but, um, but it has not uh, occurred. We'll try and, I'll try and assess a little bit about what happened uh, to the programs that were under the aegis of the uh, America Competes Act. And then we'll ask a bit of broader questions about science and technology policy in a world of constrained funding. And I'll ask and I'll pose a few questions about um, what research can examine going forward uh, in this area. And one of the things that I'd like to, um, to highlight is that in this particular case, 
the policy and the politics are, are, are impossible to pull apart from each other. And the, the extent to which the politics has, has affected the policy is extraordinary. And the political difficulties or wrangling that's gone on in the United States has had a big uh, impact on the ability of this policy to do much for the areas that it was initially intended to fund. And I would like to be able to say as an economist what the impact of that is on society. What would have been the impact had this policy been funded in the way it was initially intended? And what's actually the impact of its not having been funded at those levels? So at the end of the discussion, I'll turn the debate inside, inside of academics to ask how, how it is that economists uh, can help inform policymakers about what the right choices are. There's lots of, 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 uh, of, of light and energy shined on this particular issue, but there's actually much less understanding in general of how these science policies uh, affect outcomes uh, in, uh, in the economy. And I'll try and end on a hopeful note, which is, which is that I think that, that there are productive ways in which uh, scientists uh, and economists can work with policymakers to get better answers and, and, and allow us to do more evidence-based policy. So uh, I'm going to start with a very quick introduction of who I am and what I usually do, because what I usually do is relevant to what I was unable to do in this particular project. So uh, I'm a faculty member at the Boston University Questrom School of Business. I've been there since 2001. I'm a research associate as well at the uh, NBER. And as Reinhelda kindly pointed out, I'm, uh, I did my um, doctoral work at MIT. And often I work on uh, issues associated with the location of, phar of the pharmaceutical industry and how that affects productivity uh, w uh, in R&D. And I've worked a bunch on science and innovation policy, looking at specific institutions like biological resource centers, which are like libraries for biological materials, and asking what the impact is of those institutions on knowledge accumulation. I've looked at some general institutions like the system of scientific retractions and overall levels of innovation and science funding. And I looked at specific policies like the impact of the Bush administration human embryonic stem cell policy on US competitiveness in human embryonic stem cell research. And then I decided I would, I would take a, a crack at trying to understand what the uh, America Competes Act uh, uh, was and what it did. So typically what I'll do is I'll gather a bunch of data, I'll identify a suitable control group, I'll come up with a nice counterfactual, and I will ask for any particular policy, what are the specific ways in which it impacted outcomes? And getting the right control group is important. Getting the right econometric specification is, right, is important. Figuring out what the right measures are. And that's what I had hoped to do in my investigation of the, of the America uh, uh, Competes Act. And you know, I, could, I would like to show some sort of uh, graph like this that shows, so and this is the example of the um, Bush administration human embryonic stem cell policy relative to other countries and relative to what happened in a suitable control area of RNAi research, the US fell behind after the Bush administration's limits on stem cell funding for a few years, but then they were able to rebound. The rebound was particularly led by private institutions and wealthy institutions. And I think I can identify that all relatively well in, in, in the econometrics. And that's what I'd hoped to do for the America Competes Act. And why would I study the American Compete Act? Because when the America Compete Act was signed, it was hailed as one of the most significant achievements in US science policy to date. Technological innovation, so here's a quote from, uh, from the folks at Science Progress, Stuart Benjamin and Artie Rye. Technological innovation is a key engine of economic growth and ultimately social welfare, dot, dot, dot. Congress passed one of the best pieces of innovation legislation in years, the America Competes Act. And this was the sentiment not just of, of scientists and science uh, uh, um, administration agencies, but this was a measure that had extraordinary bipartisan support in an era where there wasn't a tremendous amount of bipartisan support on domestic policy issues in the United States. So the simple thing that the America Competes Act was designed to do was to boost science and um, innovation funding in areas in which the US science had not been uh, historically as heavily invested as it had in the past. The area where the US science policy has been historically quite heavy is in health and life sciences, particularly through the National Institutes of Health. But in physical sciences and engineering, the US is not invested to the same degree. And the main idea behind the, the 2007 Act is that the US would double its investments in a number of key agencies over a seven year period. And uh, that was the goal of the, of the 2007 Act which passed with broad support, and those, those goals were scaled back in the 2010 Act, and then in the 
And so the, the, the initial uh, act was authorized for three years, so it expired. And then the new one, well, it scaled back those, the, the, those goals. Those goals, even the scaled back act, weren't achieved. And the 2015 act, well, that was actually designed to really curb the extent to which there was investment in science and engineering, sort of the opposite of the initial uh, policy. That never pa passed through the House of Representatives, but it never passed through the Senate, and it was ultimately not signed as a, as a bill, or it's not yet been signed uh, as a bill. So w what is it, in a, in a more sophisticated way that I had hoped to do? What I would have liked to have done is, because this America Competes Act passed a passage of particular funding areas, in some places and not others, I'd hope to see what the impact would be of those areas that got lots of funding relative to those areas that could have gotten funding and didn't. It was sort of the typical scientific uh, study of these things. But because most of this didn't get implemented, and the stuff that did get implemented got implemented in start and stop somewhat haphazard ways, it's very hard to have done that, particularly when, when, uh, when I was doing most of this work um, uh, a few years ago. So most of the funding didn't get appropriated. Some did. The, the, uh, the version of, of, uh, of, the, of, uh, of energy funding that got um, supported was the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Energy. They got funding, but only after a period of time and in an odd way. And so it's possible now to do some evaluation of that, but, but, uh, but, it's, not, but it's, not, um, it's not an easy thing to have done. So, so I'll go very far back into history. The, initially, the aim of, of US science policy was simply to support invention. You know, Thomas Jefferson ensured that that was in the Constitution, that there would be a patent system, and the patent system would provide temporary monopolies in order to encourage innovation, and it would force the diffusion of knowledge associated with innovation. And other than that, in the 1700s, the US didn't do much with science policy. It wanted to do stuff with science and innovation policy right around the time of the Civil War. However, the southern states wouldn't support the, that. So the first science funding, so science in, uh, uh, um, investments that were substantial that the US government made, occurred during the Civil War when, they, when the US agreed to fund something called the Morrill Act, which established universities and created land grants for many of those. The National Academy of Science was created then. In the early part of the 1900s, there were some specific investments. But it wasn't until World War II that Vannevar Bush, the most important Bush for science policy in, in US history. <laughs> that, that joke always plays well in Europe. Um, uh, advised Franklin Delano Roosevelt on how science could lead the war effort. And then following the war effort, how scientists and the federal government could play an important role in, in, in supporting industry and supporting the economy uh, overall. And, and sort of his classic work is, is, uh, is science, um, the endless frontier. And his efforts uh, uh, result in the creation of the National Science Foundation in, uh, in 1950. Since then, a number of different economic issues and political issues have led to greater and lesser investments in US science and technology funding. So uh, the most important of which was the, was the Cold War in the 1950s and 1960s, provided very strong incentives for investment in, in military uh, work and also in, um, uh, in, in, uh, in physics and, uh, and in space exploration. In the 1970s, with the war on cancer beginning, the National Institutes of Health were established and given a fairly substantial mandate for doing life sciences work in the United States. And that is an area that has gone relatively unchallenged since its initial founding. It's both got strong support from the political uh, uh, left and the right and, and from industry uh, lobbies and a general consensus among scientists and economists that those investments really are public goods that are best done by, um, by the government. In the 1990s, a great deal of the uh, reasons why investment was made in science and technology in the United States was through worries about competitiveness. Europe had recovered from World War II. Germany was, was, was ascendant economically, uh, as was Japan. And there were a great deal of worries in the 1990s. And then in the early part of the 2000s about the impact that globalization would have on US preeminence in science and technology. And that consensus has mostly eroded in the past few years. But each one of those series of events had provided a strong impetus across all sides of the political spectrum for science and innovation, um, and innovation funding. And in particular, the America Competes Act grew out of the early 2000s fear of increasing globalization. So this, this uh, chart uh, shows the, the rise of China, the rise of Korea, the continuous increase in funding in Japan. And 
This was the type of chart that folks looked at in the early part of the 2000s in industry and in politics and said, I mean, if the US is to ma maintain its leadership, we've got to begin investing even further. The first place that crystallized US interest in policies that would increase substantially science and innovation funding for physical sciences and engineering uh, arose from something called the Gathering Storm Report. The Gathering Storm Report was put together by the National Academies of Sciences, and it brought industry leaders together um, with policy-interested uh, researchers. And it was written very, very quickly, but it came up with a number of very key recommendations. And the recommendations were, we should double in the United States the investment in science and technology, in physical sciences, and in engineering over a seven-year uh, seven period. We should increase funding for STEM education. We should also uh, find ways to equalize STEM education across uh, groups that had been historically underrepresented in STEM education. ARPA-E should be created along the lines of the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. One agency in the United States that typically has, funding, has support for funding from all sides is defense-oriented R&D, and DARPA has been especially successful in, in its approach. And the Gathering Storm report recommended something similar to DARPA be done in, uh, in, uh, in the energy space. They recommended enhanced uh, intellectual property protection and uh, promotion of innovation through tax incentives, two things that always, uh, always resonate uh, in the US and probably still, still do now. They wanted to help ensure broadband access. And there were other initiatives at around this time. This was one of the most high profile, but the, the Council on Competitiveness pushed forward something called Innovate America. The Bush administration pushed for the American uh, Competitiveness Initiative. And all of that culminated in policy making an initiative led by Bart Gordon, which had the complex and fun uh, uh, title from which the acronym uh, COMPETES was, was, uh, was born, America Creating Opportunities to Meaningfully Promote Excellence in Technology, Education, and Science. <laughs> Hence, Competes Act of 2007. It was signed um, by George uh, G.W. Bush in, in 2007, and it received strong bipartisan support, and it was passed via unanimous consent in the, sen in the Senate, which is you know, pretty much unthinkable if this policy were to arrive today in, uh, in, in, in US Congress. It was, it was greeted with substantial optimism from American high-tech firms, the scientific community. It sounded all absolutely, uh, all absolutely wonderful. And it authorized $33 billion in spending over a three-year period. Now, unfortunately, as folks here in Brussels probably know, and folks in Washington, DC know, but people outside of those cities may not know as well, the authorization of spending is not the same as the appropriation for spending. Basically, what Congress said was, we will allow us to spend up to this amount of money. But they didn't write any checks at that point. And all of the spending that was supposed to have been done in 2008 had already been appropriated. And so most of these initiatives didn't get funded in 2008. And unfortunately for this policy, and unfortunately for the world, there was a bit of a financial crisis. And that helped limit the extent to which there was funding. Um, there was funding. The key features of the America Competes Act are, are almost exactly consistent with those recommendations of the Gathering Storm, um, of the Gathering Storm Report. A few that I'll point out that weren't in the Gathering Storm Report was the National Institutes for Science and uh, sorry for Standards uh, and Technology were were supposed to get a whole bunch of this funding. The um, policy also suggested that rather than funding just uh, incremental science that lots of the money should go for high risk, high reward science, even if that means high variance in outcomes, which is a typically very difficult thing for, for uh, politicians to recommend, and, and, and one that frustrates many specific, um, specific invention uh, and innovation promotion policies. Um, one thing that I'll point out is that although the US was moving at the time towards more systematic evaluation of public policies related to science and innovation, and there was an effort to include provisions in the America Competes Act that supported policy evaluation. It wasn't mandated th for every single program. So it's not the case that everything that was funded under the America Competes Act needs to share its data so that rigorous policy analysis can be done. And we've moved more towards that uh, uh, over time, but that wasn't included in, um, in those acts. So this, this slide summarizes the, the, the areas that got funding and that didn't get funding uh, following the America Competes Act, and uh, I don't expect anyone to read what it is. I'll just point out that there's a whole lot of stuff that never got any money. So lots of the Department of Energy programs didn't get funded. Lots of the Department of Education programs, you know, they, they didn't get funded. 
And then there were some that were funded at the levels authorized, where the where the where the money actually materialized, and and you know, not a ton. So I can show you most of the data, but the real keys are that the, we started out implementing the policy as well as one might have hoped, considering that there was a financial crisis. But the the doubling idea that was supposed to be achieved within seven years got shelved relatively quickly. ARPA E eventually got funded, but it didn't get funded through the America Competes Act. It got funded through the, the ARA, through the, the stimulus package. Um, there was limited changes in the amount of funding for STEM education. The National Institute for Standards and Technology got funded, but it's a relatively small program. Uh, there was some support for, for high-risk projects, and the coordination that, that hopefully was going to achieve lots of savings ended up not, not achieving a tremendous amount of savings. So, as the Great Recession limped on, the policy came up for, for renewal in 2010. And at this point, the consensus is breaking down. So Bart Gordon, Pusher, who was uh, the, the um, Democrat, still, uh, still had the majority in the House of Representatives. Bart Gordon sponsored this, the, the um, Reauthorization Act in 2010, aimed at providing five more years of funding. That was eventually scaled back to only three more years of funding. And the aims for the funding were also, uh, were also uh, scaled back. So as we know, there's the financial crisis. The, the um, Reauthorization Act failed twice in the House. It was finally passed on the, on the third try. It was passed in the Senate, and then it was, it was reconciled. But it didn't get through Congress until the final day of, um, of the 111th Congress. But yet, it was greeted with optimism. So even though the first time hadn't worked out as people had hoped, still there was optimism about the, uh, the, the second passage. But there was reason to be doubtful about whether or not the authorized funding levels would materialize. And those doubts were absolutely, um, were absolutely realized. Congress had changed uh, uh, to a majority Republican Congress in the 112th Congress. And that group was particularly wary about funding initiatives that didn't have obvious and clear, uh, and clear payoffs. So, so the doubling path now moved from a seven-year target to a 12-year target. You'll see that that falls apart completely in the actual, uh, actual spending. And the doubling is you know, as far off now as it was in, uh, in, 2000, uh, in 2005. All of the main goals from the initial policy were included in the second policy, though, though it substantially reduced rates. One policy idea that did gain traction, but I don't think is going to transform American uh, engineering and physical science, is that the government is now authorized to provide prizes for solutions that are offered and, and uh, provided by folks outside of Congress. So rather than having to go for requests for proposals to come up with specific problem uh, solutions, the US government can now post, and often does post on a place called challenge.gov, a specific policy challenge or a specific product challenge or a specific innovation challenge, and can offer a substantial amount of, of money to organizations or individuals who meet that challenge. So for example, they might post a challenge that if you design a better backpack for NASA astronauts to take up into outer space, they will give you a half million dollars for that. And that seems to be an initiative that's working nicely, but in, but in, in, um, in, re in, in, relatively, small, uh, in relatively small amounts. So the, the, the actual appropriations begin to head down towards a 15-year uh, doubling path rather than the seven-year uh, doubling path uh, hoped for. ARPA-E begins to get funding in, in a couple hundred million dollars per, uh, per year. If anything seems to have moved forward from the America Competes Act, it's, it's ARPA-E. STEM education gets some sort of a boost, but, but, but not to the levels uh, hoped for. And, and so I think this uh, chart nicely summarizes uh, most of what the America Competes Act uh, had hoped to do and most of what it actually did. So this is, uh, this is a chart taken from the Congressional Research Service. John Sargent, Heather Gonzalez, um, and Deborah Stein have done, have done great work in, on, uh, on tracking this. And this chart shows the initial seven-year doubling path, I wish I had a, a laser to point out exactly where we are, the line trending up that's most steep was the initial plan for the doubling path. And the orange line are what the authorizations were that were included in the First America Competes Act. 
The red line that's immediately below that are what Bush, uh, George Bush, uh, the George Bush administration actually requested during that time period, which was scaled back from those requests, but was still along a 10-year uh, a 10-year doubling path. And the green line all the way at the bottom that does trend up initially and then ends up mostly flat and increasing slightly at the end is what's actually gone on. So we're on a 20-year doubling path, which I guess is a doubling path. It's not a substantial departure from what the initial rate of investment was, and so um, if we were trying to do this econometrically, I don't think we would find any effect of the, of, uh, of the policy. The counterfactual is quite hard uh, in this particular context. And so you know, this is not the happy story that, that, uh, that, that I wish I could, uh, that I wish I could, uh, could have told. And so if we look overall at American science um, uh, uh, and technology policy, the impacts on overall federal R&D, uh, sorry, of overall um, federal R&D and then total R&D don't end up looking quite positive. They don't seem to be meeting the challenge of, uh, of countries like Korea uh, and, uh, and China. It is important to point out that more than half of, of US um, uh, uh, R&D is in the defense area. And that's also declining uh, in, the most, uh, in the most recent period. And it's also worth pointing out that more than half of the non-defense R&D is spent on health. And if anything continues to maintain its levels of funding, it's, uh, it's health, uh, health and life sciences. Energy is a very small fraction of the total U.S. Um, uh, the total U.S. Uh, uh, government spending um, as our natural, natural uh, resources. And so in case it's useful, I mean, these are just, just easily available uh, statistics. I guess the last, the, the last set of things that I'll show before, before trying to wrap up is here's data on overall levels of R&D spending across countries and comparing uh, and aggregating for the, uh, for, um, for the European Union. And the rates look sort of nicely increasing in the United States and, and, uh, and in Europe, but wow, China's really, really made some substantial advancements in, in, its, in its absolute levels. And it's also made some pretty important advances in, um, uh, in, its, in its rate of investments. What's particularly interesting in this chart, so this chart here shows R&D expenditures as a percentage of GDP for, for a number of, uh, of countries, and the US and, and, uh, and European Union and, and even Germany have been overtaken recently by South Korea in this area, and, and China continues to, to increase its investments. And one of the questions that we might ask as economists is, should we actually worry about this? But on one hand, it's quite nice for the whole world if there's lots of investments by countries other than those that have historically made investments in science and technology, if they continue to do it. The consensus in the US was always that leadership in, the, in industry and leadership in economic prospects are dependent upon leadership in science and technology. But if there's true spillovers, and those spillovers go very quickly from one developed country to another developed country, then you know, the, the, the skeptical view is perhaps it does indeed make sense to benefit from the investments made by other countries than to be the one, con the, the, the nation continuously providing spillovers to other countries. And uh, as an economist, I am, uh, I am sad to say, I don't know the answer to that question. And I think it would be very lovely for economists to be able to make investments in trying to understand these things and to be able to provide very specific guidance to policymakers. But, uh, but most of the numbers that economists have are not those that are as solid as the analyses of specific policies. I think we can work towards those, particularly if we have the ability to analyze specific policies more usefully, and we can we could draw from a, an ever wider array of policy analyses to say something about the rates of return to one country versus another, investing in science and technology. So uh, overall, it's a little bit hard to say exactly what the impact was yet of the ARPA-E funding. It seems to have been substantial. And I'll skip over some of the, some of the more detailed um, uh, analyses. I'll, I'll say that the America Competes Act of 2015 that was passed by the House of Representatives but not by the Senate and therefore never became uh, a law uh, demonstrates the extent to which the policy consensus in the U.S. has broken down. The vote in the House of Representatives was entirely on a party uh, line basis. No Democrats voted in favor of the particular bill. The bill was one that was going to limit science funding increases in physical sciences and uh, and in engineering, it was also going to put very strict limits on the way in which the National Science Foundation could allocate money across its various directives. And to the extent that Republicans didn't vote for the, for the, um, 
the bill, it was because they, the, the ones who didn't vote were frustrated that the bill didn't do enough to curb science and, and innovation investment. Uh, and so th that's why they withheld, um, withheld, uh, withheld their votes. So the conclusions, I guess, are this. The American Competes Act of 2007 was introduced with great fanfare, and it was a tremendously exciting idea that galvanized folks on, on many sides and in, in many uh, segments uh, of interest around science and technology. And most of those investments didn't materialize. The American Competes Reauthorization Act scaled back the, the aims of the 2007 policy. And I think it's fairly fair to say that with the exception of ARPA-E and a few other uh, uh, smaller initiatives, most of the goals of the 2007 Act went, uh, went unrealized. But as I pointed out, it's, a little, it's unclear to me exactly what the implications are for GDP per capita in the United States, for productivity in the United States. And it, it's worth entertaining the hypothesis that local leadership may be less essential, local leadership in science and technology may be less essential for uh, social welfare than it had been previously assumed. It may also be, be worth entertaining the hypothesis that it's even more essential than had been previously assumed. But what's frustrating is that, that economists aren't be able to, what's frustrating to me at least is that, that economists and other scientists don't have ideal answers to, to give to policymakers. I'd like to give everyone at this, in this room a number and, 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 and I'm, not, I'm not even close to doing that for, for the America Competes Act. So in order to have an impact, the scholars who are, who are studying this need to have a better, uh, better tools and better access uh, to the types of data that will allow us to do these analyses. Some of them we can't do very easily. You know, the impact of science funding takes many, many generations before, we can, before it can ultimately be realized. But we can do a very good job of analyzing specific policies if we're able to collaborate with policymakers. And so the hopeful note that I'll end on is that this seems to be occurring, uh, this interaction, this productive interaction between economists, other scientists, and, uh, and policymakers. And, and my impression is that it seems to be accelerating within Europe in, in, in a way that's, that's true for some parts of, of the US, but, but it, it's perhaps accelerating here even more. So thank you very much uh, for, your, for your attention. I look forward to, to talking with everyone. Thank you. That was an excellent presentation with lots of uh, food for discussion, so uh, I'm sure we'll have a very interesting discussion uh, here. Um, but before we, we, we have a number of um, views from uh, invited discussants, uh, so you, you mentioned very clearly how you can use war as a, as a, as a good rhetoric for uh, motivating science funding. Uh, but also global loss of global competitiveness. Uh, and then you always talk about uh, Asia. And I know that Europe is not one of the global competitive challenges for the US, <laughs> not in the rhetoric. So it doesn't help to motivate your funding uh, here. So it's not on the map in the US. But nevertheless, we, we care about Europe. And so we would like to know also what the perspective is of, of Europe in terms of, of uh, funding for science. Um, we will talk a bit more about the, the overall funding for science and the grand challenges, but that's what Kurt will do. But before we do that, uh, we first would like to uh, have a view on, on how easy it is to, to convince in Europe for basic uh, science funding uh, here, the bottom-up uh, ERC uh, type of funding, uh, because we have uh, Jean-Pierre Bourguignon, who is the, currently the president of the European Research uh, Council as of 2014, uh, who constantly has to defend the budget uh, for ERC, so we will have a, a, a lot of experience experience on, on, um, uh, to, to share with us. Uh, professor Jean-Pierre Bourguignon is a, is a professor in mathematics. He was the director of the Institut des Autres uh, Études Scientifiques uh, in Paris, uh, but he uh, was a very preeminent um, uh, scholar in, in, in uh, mathematics. He was also the president of the European Mathematical Society. Uh, he also was a board member of the Euro Science Organization, so he has always been very heavily uh, involved in, in uh, science policy uh, in mathematics, but also more generally uh, here. So Jean-Pierre, do you want to share your opinions with this? And, uh, Thank you for inviting me and uh, giving me an opportunity to react to what we heard. Maybe you cut off this one. Yeah. Um, actually, uh, I would like to make uh, comments on, on three, three points. A very brief point on the US compared to Europe, uh, because uh, I think uh, one thing one must keep in mind that uh, European funding of research 
is about 8 to 9 percent of the overall expenditures in research in Europe. When in the US, federal funding, of course, is a massive uh, contributor. So comparing the two is already uh, not completely fair because uh, the weight of the national policies is extremely uh, dominant in Europe still. And uh, the level of coordination between the national policies is uh, quite limited. And I'm confronted with this very directly because I, I do meet ministers uh, on a regular basis and uh, even uh, most of them have no idea what the other ones are doing. So uh, that's the uh, first situation. The second one which I want to, to stress also because in the US uh, system, so I'm not sure about uh, in your statistics whether philanthropy uh, is, is counted, probably not, or it is? Uh, it's counted in the, in the overall, but okay. not in the federal. Okay, and of course it shouldn't be in the federal, but uh, in the U.S. for sure, I mean, uh, philanthropy is playing a very, very significant role in a number of areas, uh, and also uh, in particular in uh, helping, uh, I mean, new sectors to emerge, which uh, at the moment in Europe a few countries have uh, philanthropy being developed, some others are just uh, at the very, very beginning, so this makes a first difference. So this was the first comment I want to make, and then the next one I want to make, which I think was uh, also, you, you, it was present in uh, in what you said, which is uh, one thing. One other reason why, in the situation, in the fragmentation in Europe is even more visible, is that in the U.S., in a number of issues, actually the DoD funding, which is the Department of Defense, has been extremely important to look at very risky uh, new uh, type of science. When actually in Europe there is, of course, no uh, defense uh, global uh, policy. And uh, even some countries, some big countries like Germany, are supposed not to spend so too much money on defense. And uh, actually, they are not even spending the amount they are allowed to spend on defense, which uh, is something which I know the French government is putting forward quite often as, uh, of course, an easy way of balancing your budget, not spending money on things on which others are spending money. But uh, so this makes a big difference because, of course, the, Depend the Department of Defense in the U.S., is contributing to development of research in a very substantial way, when in Europe uh, this is extremely fragmented and, and not at all the same. So that was my first preliminary remark. So of course, I, I need to be short, so uh, Reinhild insisted on how difficult it is to convince people. So next uh, stage of complication is the fact that any decision at European level in terms of funding for research, so now I'm talking about European funding, um, of course, has to go through a process, which is a general process for the functioning of the uh, European Union, which is quite complex, because you need three bodies to get together, and one body has the duty of preparing the discussion of the other, which is the European Commission. But, of course, you have the Parliament, uh, who finally has to approve uh, the budget, and also you have the Council, which is really the 28 governments. And on the side, uh, on, on this side, it, it's really quite complicated because first of all at the parliament level the uh, committee which is uh, supervising research and uh, actually uh, giving its opinion on the, the, the budget for the support of research is the called ITRE committee so ITRE stands for I for industry T uh, used to be transport but it's gone but it's still there and R for research and E for energy so you see you have in the same compartment three uh, elements which of course have interaction but uh, quite different from uh, what you have in the US system where you really can talk directly to people uh, in charge of research. So this ITRE committee of course is uh, looking into the European policy very carefully and uh, these are the people I, I try and meet as often as I can. To, to discuss uh, how they feel about the developments and uh, for example recently they issued a report on uh, the own report, a report by the European Parliament on the uh, FP7 uh, pro uh, framework, Program 7, uh, after the Commission itself had its own uh, study on uh, FP7 by a high-level expert group. And so I'm, I'm just pointing to this because it means, uh, for example, uh, one thing which was last year very much on, on my own agenda by as president of ERC was the discussions on the so-called FC. I'm sure you heard about this with the European Fund for Strategic Investment. And uh, so Europe had decided at the level of the Commission and uh, I mean and the Council that uh, a new type of fund should be uh, mobilized. And uh, of course, it was it was not in the budget. 
and, and therefore you had to find money somewhere and uh, some people proposed that some money should be taken away from Horizon 2020, which is presently the European program for the support of research and innovation for the period 2014-2020. And then uh, the discussion was uh, how much money is taken from, uh, from Horizon 2020. Initially, it was 2.7 billion. In the end, it was 2.2 billion. And to get this uh, change in the amount of money taken away was a quite long and complicated process. Maybe one day I will write it down what I saw of it, which was a true adventure. And I must say, a totally chaotic discussion. But in a way, it, uh, something happened. So it shows that sometimes from chaos, something happens. But um, anyway, so it shows that this is extremely complex. And to identify who are the true players and the key players, what is the rationale be between, be behind the, the people, be, be, behind people's uh, standings, is extremely difficult. And uh, uh, well, if you work on it, you can have the feeling that you achieve something. I'm not sure you, you, your, your belief is correct, but anyway, some things happen. And my last point, uh, which is uh, not negligible, of course, is uh, uh, looking into the future and to see how we... So, you know, uh, in a sense, uh, if when I talk to Franz Cordova, who is the head of NSF, uh, she, she tells me, well, but you are in a fantastically comfortable situation because the rules of Europe makes uh, the budget decided for seven years, so it's a fantastically comfortable situation. I have to fight for my budget year after year, and it's um, more and more difficult uh, presently. Uh, so she's spending a huge amount of time uh, actually on Capitol Hill talking to people in the parliament. Uh, but, um, so, but actually, this is some kind of an illusion because uh, for, for two reasons. First of all, there will be a midterm review, and nobody knows really what will happen from it. Um, I know that, uh, I mean, Europe very clearly has to put on the table some new amounts of money for new emergencies like uh, refugee crisis or things of this nature. So from where would this money come? Not clear at all. And of course, temptation is to come to take it away from programs which seem to have not yet been attributed. So you, you people don't know they have the money, so you can take it away more easily. And um, so, of course, that's one one issue. But the next thing is uh, then the process by which you discuss the future, which is now I'm talking about the period 2021 to. Uh, maybe 2028 or, uh, or 2027, I'm sorry, or maybe 2031, because it could be either five years, seven years, or five plus five, that is 10 years. Um, we'll start in 2018, will last um, more likely two years before it's approved by the parliament. So you see the process by which you discuss is so uh, involved, of course, at all the time you have the European Commission at the origin of the documents, and but um, even this process is uh, so heavy that uh, clearly many people know that you need flexibility, you need the capacity to react to new situations, and it looks like a system like this is not providing this kind of a reactivity. And of course, for reactivity, you need uh, the correct trust that you need the control system should be should be there because that's public money, so control is completely normal. But it should be done in a way in which you you really balance the, the decisions against the results and not just uh, on the, the fact that you agreed some years back on the way things should be done. So this makes the whole discussion quite uh, an involved one. And so my final word will be to say, how do you makes things happen. Well, it means talking to people. And uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know how you appreciate that, but for many politicians, uh, of course, the um, horizon is the next election. If you look in Europe, uh, 28 countries, the, uh, there is an horizon every month almost. And uh, for different people, of course, not for all of them. And uh, so it means that uh, all the time you, you think you have developed a very good relation, that is substantial relation with somebody, and you discover the person has disappeared because the government has been changed, or the government is in formation, like it happened for Belgium for two years, and uh, you don't have any minister to talk to. But uh, <laughs> so, so anyway, it shows that uh, to, to really be, um, I mean, uh, operative, I mean, operational in such an environment is... Uh, is a difficult task. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean-Pierre. So you indeed re raised the issue of, of trust, uh, and also that on the European side, actually, uh, the whole uh, 
public science support is really very much based on idiosyncrasies. And what's really missing also at the European side, was also pointed out by Jeff at the US side, is this missing of, of scientific evidence-based discussion of, of science policy uh, here. So it seems to be also on the European side a bit the same uh, <coughs> problem here. Um, the next discussion that we have is Kurt van der Berge, who will also look at, at uh, EU funding, uh, but from a more broader perspective, so uh, more the, the whole Horizon 2020 uh, program. Kurt van der Berge is very well placed to do this. Uh, he is currently director for uh, the Policy Development and Coordination Unit in uh, oh, uh, in DG Research and Innovation. Uh, but before, he was a director uh, within the same DG for Climate Action. So he's particularly, I think, also interested in the ARPA-E <laughs> uh, competition. Uh, and before that, he was the head of cabinet of uh, Commissioner Janis Potocnik, uh, responsible for research. And at that time, was also very heavily involved in the setup of the EOC as well. So he has a very good view on all the different pieces of, of, uh, of the Horizon 2020. Um, so, uh, Kurt, can you share us your opinions on uh, how we could, uh, how the European pr process works? Well, thank you very much, Renild, and uh, I'm really glad to be here and to get to know more about Jeff's work, uh, which is really very welcome. Um, but also, we can always learn from the US, where not Even from their mistakes eh? exactly exactly especially maybe from their mistakes um we we're not the same um and i think mr bourguignon has very eloquently already said why we're different but we can still learn from each other uh from what is done well and 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 less well um i would like to start with uh underscoring the call uh, that Jeff made for more evidence-based policy making. Um, that is really a big need we have also in the European Commission, um, and I'll come back to this in a second. Um, it's impossible to compare the incomparable, um, but we can say we have uh, some similarities. You had uh, the call to double uh, funding. We have our 3% target uh, since the year 2000, which has had some effect over time. Uh, we have seen an increase of research investment in the EU from 1.8% globally of GDP to a bit above 2%. And what is remarkable for us in Europe is that since 2008, uh, the years of the deep economic crisis, the investment in research has continued to grow at slow pace, much less than we would have hoped for or, or wanted, uh, but it has continued to grow. So that in itself, I think, is a, is a very good thing, and it shows what actually political statements um, and political hype can do uh, for the better. Our problem is, of course, in Europe that we have a, an increasing gap with the rest of the world. Uh, we have a gap of 1 to 1.5 percent with uh, some of our advanced uh, trading partners like uh, the US, uh, South Korea, but increasingly also uh, China. Um, with the US, for example, the gap is about $75 billion per year that we invest less uh, in research um, and development in Europe. So that's quite sizable. And, but I think the difference there is that um, we're not that much lagging behind in public investment overall. The biggest gap is in business R&D. And there we have not found yet the right business environment and legal and poli policy environment to uh, make up for that uh, gap. Um, there are many differences between us and the US. Uh, the public-private, uh, the defense, as Mr. Bourguignon has said, the coordination difference we have. Uh, most of the funding for science in the US is at federal level. Here it's at national, regional uh, level. As Mr. Bourguignon has said, less than 10% of, of the research funding is actually at European level. I think we also have a difference um, if we look at the programs at the European level, um, I would not say federal level, because that's very controversial in Europe, uh, but at the European level, um, you said that in the US, the uh, history of the U federal programs is we fund invention, and gradually competitiveness uh, ambitions or objectives have been graphed on that. In Europe, it's a different, it's the opposite. Uh, the framework programs started in the 1980s, out of a concern of competitiveness vis-a-vis -vis Japan, especially. And it's over time that actually the framework program has broadened to include other uh, dimensions, uh, like now with the ERC, the more frontier uh, or fundamental uh, research. 
which means that the framework program, which remains one big, big program, is supposed to cater more and more for different objectives, different needs, um, and that in itself uh, creates a lot of complexity. And for example, you mentioned uh, the prices. Well, we are now also having a legal basis uh, to experiment with prices, and we start doing this. Um, and there, that's another area where we can learn a lot, I think, from, from the US. Um, I think what we've seen over time is that there has been consistent support for increasing the budgets for research and development over the last 20 years in the European budget. We've seen an, a continuous increase of uh, the research uh, budgets. We see that um, overall there is an increasing growing political support for R&D investment um, at the national but also at the European level. And that is especially strong in the European Parliament. Um, when the European Commission proposed to take money away from the ERC, it was actually members of the European Parliament that uh, defended the ERC very vocally. Um, it's a bit different on the side of our member states because there the budget discussions are very political, very ideological sometimes. Um, the member states as an executive bodies, they have to deal with trade-offs between different uh, needs and expectations. We have now the migration pressures, which will require a lot more resources. So they see it more as a zero-sum game, while the politicians in the parliament uh, typically see, well, we need more research because that's the future of our prosperity and our competitiveness uh, in Europe. Um, that's a bit different on, on, the, on the council side. And that will play out even more strongly in the upcoming uh, negotiations on our seven year or maybe more uh, years budget, um, because these pressures on what Europe should do is incre are increasing um, a lot. Um, in approaching the next cycle of the financial framework, which is for us the real battleground, more than designing the next framework program, um, what we see is that we will need to become much stronger in the evidence base. Um, we will need to show much more than before what are the results of the investments we've done over time. And to be honest, we're not that good at it yet. Uh, so there the inputs uh, and the evidence and methodologies especially that we can get from economists and others uh, would be very welcome. Um, we'll be especially looking at what kind of leverage have we had uh, with this investment at the European level. Because if we have to demonstrate the impact of European f investment in R&I, uh, research and innovation, we really have a conundrum in the sense that we have to be able to demonstrate the impact first of research for competitiveness, economic growth and jobs. Then we have to demonstrate the impact, the positive impact of public investment in R&I. And then on top of that, we have to demonstrate what is the added value of doing that at European level as opposed to national, regional, local level, which is a difficulty that you have much less in the United States. So this question of EU added value for us is a very important one, uh, and one where we will need to have many more answers uh, available than, than we had in the past. Um, but all the evidence that we want and need is a necessary condition for making the case for RNI investment, but it's not sufficient. Because what we need on top of that, um, and we've seen that from our past experience, is a creating a political buzz about something that is new. For FP7, it was the ERC. And we got additional money, additional budgets for research in the European budget because there was this promise of the ERC, which mobilized a lot of stakeholders. Um, with Horizon 2020, the ERC continued, and on top of that, we added the whole inno innovation dimension in Horizon 2020, which was more or less new. Innovation in resp to respond to the global societal challenges. The question is, what will it be for the next one after Horizon 2020? Uh, there, I think we will also need something new that creates a hype, a buzz, uh, something that politicians 
want to identify with and be associated uh, with. Um, and in, in doing that, and I would like to conclude on that, um, there are a couple of points of tension that I see coming um, in not only the interim evaluation and the midterm review of the MFF, but especially the next uh, framework program and, and research and innovation budgets. One is how do we articulate results and leverage? What time frame do we allow for studying, examining the results we get? Is it very short term? Or are we allowed to look at it longer term? Um, do we want disruptive change, innovation? Or do we go for more incremental innovation? Um, a second fault line, if I may say, is do we still want to give direction to R&I investments? Or do we want to really have much more bottom-up approaches, like the ERC? which uh, is a model that is now also inspiring the innovation uh, world, where Mr. Moidas has said um, we are looking at the European Innovation Council, much more bottom-up. So direction versus bottom-up is a big issue for us. Um, in terms of impacts and, and time frame, do we continue with grants? Or, as some political leaders are, are advocating, do we go more and more towards financial instruments, loans, which is a big issue uh, coming up, uh, certainly in the internal discussions in the European Commission. Um, as this framework program is becoming more and more uh, complex and the number of objectives it wants to realize, do we go for mono-objective programs? like the ERC is a bit, excellence, nothing else? Um, or do we also go for multiple objective um, approaches, where we bring together many different objectives or expectations uh, and needs? Um, and uh, last point I would like to indicate, um, which will certainly keep us very busy, is the innovation divide in Europe, of course. Um, because uh, the research and innovation landscape in northwestern Europe is very different from what it is in southern parts of Europe or eastern parts of Europe. Um, and if we don't find an answer to that, um, also in the context of research and innovation, I think we'll have a much more difficult discussion on the next uh, research and innovation uh, budgets. So in concluding, I would say that um, we are well placed for the discussions, um, but it won't be easy and there are lots of points of tension that we will have to uh, grapple with and find answers to. And there the evidence, uh, Jeff, that you and colleagues are providing is very important for us. Yeah, thank you, Kurt. Uh, I think that's a very good point. Uh, it's already very important for the discussion that you ask the right questions. <laughs> and I think you really um, provided a very good uh, introduction to that. And I'm sure we will, can already start the discussion on these right questions uh, uh, here. Uh, also, I'd like to point out that this innovation divide is something uh, that's also uh, on our plate as well. So we came out today with a new Bruegel policy contribution exactly illustrating that uh, innovation divide. Um, but before we start the, the, the discussion, uh, the private sector has already come on board several times uh, in the discussion uh, here. So we have in Europe uh, the gap in private R&D, but that's a so big topic, uh, we will not be discussing this today. But another way in which the private sector also is important is how important it is to support uh, the federal funding or, or, or the um, uh, public funding for uh, R&D. Um, so in that respect, we're very happy to have as a, as a, as a last discussant somebody from the corporate sector, uh, Tommy Dolan. He's currently the vice president of Pfizer uh, in the worldwide pharmaceutical sciences. He's also the head of the Pfizer sandwich site, head, <laughs> which is based in, in, in the UK. Um, he um, started his career in Pfizer in 1990, but held various positions uh, within uh, this global company uh, here, leading groups involved in a very broad spectrum of all kinds of drug delivery technologies uh, and, and products across all stages of development. So he knows 
the drug development process very well. But at the same time, I think he's also very much concerned on the, on the public policy discussion on this. He's a past chair of the UK Academy of Pharmaceutical Sciences, uh, a member of the UK Academy of Pharmaceutical Sciences Advisory Board. So he's uh, very much um, in, 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 in the right um, uh, the right circles also where these kind of policies are, are also being discussed here. So your view from the corporate side, both from the US as well as the EU <coughs> angle, uh, very much appreciated uh, to kick the discussion. Tommy? Thank, <coughs> thank you very much. Um, firstly, thanks for the invite. It's great delight to be here in such a very crowded small room, but uh, <laughs> nice to see so many faces here. So I, I'll bring a slightly different perspective to the discussion. Um, Sometimes I thought my job was difficult in the corporate world, but here in the machinations of US and EU policy, and maybe, maybe I've got the easy tack here. Um, so the first thing to say, so it, it may be useful giving a little bit of context about the pharmaceutical industry, because I think it's important in terms of the research base and how we interact. So I think, I think the first thing to say is it's an incredibly intensive research-based organisation, and we probably plough back in more than any other sector in terms of sales percentage and turn into to R&D. So for a company like Pfizer, at any one time, we will have over a 1,000 R&D collaborations on the go globally, and that's a necessity in terms of getting new medicines. But some of the discussion we've just had, it, it might be worthwhile just talking a little bit the, the the drug development process to give you a perspective. So... The journey to get a drug is, is a long and tortuous journey. It, it, we work in cycles of typically 10 to 15 years, which when you juxtapose that to an election cycle is clearly a, a very different um, perspective. Um, it's a highly risky business. Um, there's a lot of attrition, and there's a lot of attrition even from taking basic research, which is done in academia, and then internalising that within our industry to translate that into medicinal products. So most of the basic research that we take into industry to try and get a medicinal product will not yield a medicinal product. But yet we need that basic research base that we partner with in order to get groundbreaking new science. Now partly you could view that the failures are throwaways or you could view the failure as part of a virtuous learning cycle <coughs> where you feed that knowledge back in, either view is, is probably legitimate. But for us, it's the failures in the knowledge cycle can be as important to us as the successes. And so that partnership becomes very important to us. It's, it's a translational industry that we're involved in. Um, we translate basic science into hopefully commercial entities for patients. And, and that's an important attribute that, that we bring. Now, just in terms of um, the current paradigm, because I think it sets the scene from the, for the, the, the R&D public policy, um, we are at the dawn of a new era in medical sciences. <clears throat> so when the genome was sequenced at the start of the millennium, that was really the first part of a journey and probably gives you a good example of the time frames that we're working on. Because it's only really now, from the sequencing of the genome in 2000 and 2001, that we're really starting to see the understanding of molecular pathways that will subsequently lead to new therapies. So when you think the genome was sequenced at the start of the millennium, that's starting to see new therapies now and probably for the next decade. So you're talking about that time over a 10 to 25 year cycle. Additionally, when you look at what we're seeing in things like cancer, so if you take breast cancer or ovarian cancer as a good example, which typically in the past would have been used, viewed, viewed as one or two diseases, is now viewed as 40 or 50 diseases. So you think about that. You think in the knowledge base that is required to understand the segmentation of something like ovarian cancer from two diseases into approximately 50 diseases. Now, no one company can do that alone. No one academic institution can do that alone, but yet that is a huge societal challenge because without that basic knowledge leading to new precision medicines, we won't see the cures for society that, that really we should expect to see. And it is the partnership between the public sector and the private sector that has allowed the segmentation of these diseases, that is allowing us very precise and specific new therapies that ultimately, hopefully, will mean that diseases like cancer 
will become chronic conditions that we live with and not life-threatening conditions that either us or our family um, suffer from. And that partnership is very, very important to us in order to, to realise that. The other thing to mention that we've been talking about is um, a lot of our industry, um, it would be great if everything was a quantum leap breakthrough. Sadly, everything is not a quantum leap breakthrough. And the, the medical industry over time, the cardiovascular medicines that hopefully maybe you don't, but maybe your, your parents take for the young, the young faces in the room, really has been a journey over decades of incremental improvement. And so one of the challenges we face is how do we value incremental improvements? And I know it is something that the, the, clearly the public sector wrestle with. And there probably does need to be some balance and some recognition that there needs to be breakthrough disruptive science evaluated within the public sector. But there also needs to be a recognition that not everything will lead to a, a cure or an improvement. And the incremental science must have some place in the sequencing in order to get, to get new therapies. L let me just say a, a couple of words, about maybe a couple of areas of examples wh where it matters to us. So um, we, we work in rare diseases. There's over 7,000 rare diseases. You can imagine the complexity of understanding the molecular pathways of those rare diseases. So we've set up a, a consortium in the, in the U it happens to be in the UK, where we work with private public institutions to leverage knowledge to try and get new therapies for a number of the, those rare diseases. It allows us to work with world leading experts in the academic community and hopefully internalise that knowledge which will ultimately translate to new medicines. We've got a medicine for lung cancer which is a precise medicine that is allowing people with even stage 4 lung cancer to, to really live way beyond former expectations. The reason we've got that medicine is because a number of years ago, people developed molecular pathways that allowed us to develop a medicine to hit that molecular pathway that's very precise and allows people to live with stage three, stage four lung cancer. The last example just to give is something that we work on where we need to collaborate pretty broadly because what we're starting to find, we're starting to develop medicines using really much more in silico and predictive models it's a different way to design medicinal products. We need to collaborate with the best academics because ultimately, and we need to collaborate with other pharma companies, because ultimately we need to work with regulatory authorities to describe to a regulatory authority that we have developed a medicine <coughs> in a very different way than the old empirical and experimental methods that we use in the past. If we, Pfizer, or any other company go in individually to the regulator, that's a very difficult discussion to get that medicine through. The, the partnership with academics, who are world-leading in terms of algorithms and in silico predictive and mathematical techniques, not only allows us to get to the right answer quicker, which ultimately helps patients get their medicine quicker, but equally, it means we go in with a much more authoritative and legitimate voice when we have the discussion with the regulatory authorities, which hopefully ultimately will benefit patients. We've been members of the, you know, we've also been part of large consortia. The IMI programme um, is, is something that we're very active in across a number of areas. In the interest of time, I won't talk about that, but I will just touch on the, maybe the, we talked about the difference between EU and, and, and US policy. Um, what we've seen is pretty much consistency across the, the biological sciences. Um, the US has held pretty firm on clinical and biological sciences. We talked about the physical sciences. And we have seen a little bit of a shift. We've done much more physical science work in Europe, whether that's European policy or Irish, UK policy or whatever. I, I don't know the genesis of that particularly. But we certainly have seen a, a greater flavour of strength in the engineering sciences and a willingness to focus on the engineering sciences than we have in a consistent and aligned way within the US. But the last thing probably to say is what's important for us is, is consistency in policy, consistency in level of fundings because of the time scales that we work on is crucially important. The skills agenda to us is vitally important. We, we cover a broad area of skills and operating in areas and having access to that skill base clearly matters to us. And the last thing, just to make the point, is that this starts and ends with the patient. So unless there are public policy initiatives in place and value assessments that allows the uptake of innovative medicines for patients, 
then clearly that competes the, the virtuous cycle from the par pharma perspective. But suffice to say, the, the public sector to us is of vital importance, and it should be of vital importance to you in terms of finding new cures for the diseases that we hope ultimately will become a thing of the past. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Tommy. Uh, so there was a very clear uh, case why indeed the corporate sector also has an interest in, in, in helping to defend the public uh, spending for this. But of course it's a public good. <laughs> and and uh, so the question is uh, who is willing to invest in, in, in helping to make the case like in the gathering uh, storm reports. And of course the case of pharma is, is, is a case where the links are very evident, but I think it's not only uh, exclusive for, for pharma as well. So uh, I think we had a lot of uh, uh, issues that we that we already started um, discussing before, and I'm sure that actually the people here would like to discuss each other's uh, comments on this. But I still think uh, we owe it to the public to first give them a first uh, round to be also able to uh, to express their opinions uh, here. Um, but I think what already was obvious from the discussion here was uh, it's not just only an issue of, of how much budget we will actually be spending, but also uh, evaluating the impact of that of, of that budget and the different components of that uh, here. So the, the mixing of the right levels of risk, the mixing of the right horizon, short term, uh, long term, different uh, challenges uh, to meet directed, bottom up uh, here, and different instruments. So I think that's definitely a very important issue we will also uh, need to address uh, here. But let's now open the floor for discussion. Uh, any... Yeah, so perhaps best before you start your question, if you can identify where you're coming from, that would help to interpret <laughs> the question. Yeah, sure. Uh, Gerd Schoenwelder from the European Commission, from the Energy Directorate in the Research and Innovation DG. Um, I found it really instructive what you told us about the America Competes Act, especially this provision of, of doubling funding uh, in a certain time period. And I found it especially interesting since we are confronted with a, another U.S. initiative to double funding on clean energy, the Mission Innovation Initiative that the Commission, of course, wants to join as well. And given your research on America Competes, um, what's your prognosis on what will happen with Mission Innovation? So, um, <laughs> oh, shall we first collect some questions? Sure. Or? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Let's take. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I might just actually sit here. Um, I'm from Sanofi. My name is Darren Kinsella. Um, I have a question to Jeff, but I'd be interested in hearing um, comments from the other panelists. Um, and it refers to the um, bio clusters in the US, which is in Boston, uh, where you're based, but also in California. What are the US policy initiatives which enable these sectors to flourish in the US, particularly in these two places? But also, is it private investment? And if it is private investment, are there public policy initiatives in the US that incentivize private investment in these sectors? Good afternoon, my name is Eleni Palioros. I work for the European Space Agency. And um, I, I mean, I found uh, today's panel to be very interesting. And I have a question related to targeting certain sectors. For example, America Competes targeted certain sectors, whereas the European funding scheme under the framework programs is very broad. And I'm, I have a question about how appropriate it is to ask some of the questions that are being considered for FP9 or whatever it's going to be called, um, how that impacts different sectors and if it's how you look at the difference between America Competes, which was trying to look at a more uh, focused set of um, uh, themes versus what Europe does under FP9 or other uh, framework programs. Thanks. So maybe that's already a first round uh, of questions where I can perhaps also <laughs> attach some more. So um, I was a bit surprised by, uh, like you mentioned also, that uh, there was actually not really 
already embedded in the Compete Act an evaluation uh, process uh, here. And we already discussed how important this actually is to have better data for, for a funded uh, dis uh, discussion on this. But that, of course, has to be built in, in any new program, is that uh, the data will be collected and will be evaluated or not. So you think that, that's a, that that was a deliberate, uh, actually that already could predict why the Compete Act <laughs> was not really a serious uh, exercise uh, or not? So I think most a number of questions actually started with, with you, so you get the first okay. reaction. Uh, right, so, uh Thank you very much for the questions. I'll attempt to answer um, them as best I can and also to push some of them to the, to the other panelists. So um, uh, with respect to the energy initiatives, I don't think that I have enough information yet that I can be able to, to make prognoses for the extent to which they'll succeed or fail. I think as, as Jean-Pierre uh, immediately responded, a lot will depend on the policy environment going forward. Of the investments that are currently made, this seems to be an area in which there's at least some degree of evaluation that's already uh, planned in. RPE is working with, with a panel, uh, including a bunch of science-oriented um, uh, uh, economists at MIT, to evaluate those particular programs. To jump from that then to the question of the overall evaluation process of the America Competes Act, I think that the America Competes Act went further than most other science and innovation funding initiatives in the US to move towards evaluation. But it didn't list for each one of the initiatives specific ways in which it could be evaluated. And I can also understand why, if I were a director of an agency or if I were a broad policymaker, I might be cautious about evidence-based policy analysis. If we're trying to evaluate the, the, the economic impact of very, very large investments, like, say, the Manhattan Project or CERN, the extent to which those impact the economy takes such long periods of time and such twists and turns that it's quite hard to, to get numbers. And one of the ways in which evidence-based policy, evidence policy may have a negative impact is requiring a number that can be evaluated within the short term may make it easier to cut things whose impact really is quite substantial but much harder to measure. And so I think that the, to the extent to which we can evaluate policies, there, it's much easier to do for very specific policies with particular policy objectives. And where, where economists may be particularly helpful is identifying variations in features that have specific impacts. One example of that is a, uh, an agency that, that has a very large budget uh, in the United States, is, uh, or an initiative that has a large budget, is the SBIR program, the Small Business Innovation uh, Research Program, which is administered by a large number of different federal agencies. There's no way to collect all of the data about which programs get funded and which ones don't get funded. And even if we could, it's unclear whether those investments are ones on which we'd like to hang specific numbers. But what we could do is that one of the goals of the SBIR program is to in, uh, create incentives for innovation among women entrepreneurs and historically underrepresented minorities. And by looking at differences in features across location, there we can get assessments of how the program is having an, uh, an impact on some of its goals. So I don't think that this is necessarily because there, were few, there weren't as many evaluation mechanisms as might be ideal included in the Competes Act that it didn't, that it didn't end up um, uh, as successful as it could. And uh, Darren, for your question, here's where I'll attempt to push things, uh, to push things on, on to Tommy, who may know better. My understanding is that the, the bio and biopharma clusters in the United States have evolved mostly independent of specific targeted policies with the exception of the policies that supported the base for academic research in those areas. So initially, the most vibrant area for, biological, uh, for, uh, for the biopharmaceutical in the United States was the Philadelphia, New Jersey, New York area. And part of the reason for that is that uh, uh, the University of Pennsylvania and, 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 and Rutgers uh, and, and the Philadelphia College of, of, uh, of Pharmacy helped create the first generation of science-oriented pharmaceutical firms. Many of the firms grew up there and then, and then, and then, uh, and then moved elsewhere. And recently, we've seen uh, a large number of pharmaceutical firms and biotech firms moving to the Boston area, ostensibly because of access to researchers at Harvard and MIT, and, uh, and moving to the DC area in order to access NIH research, moving to California as well for access to research. So I think that, and this is where Tommy can, can correct me, that the location of the US clusters is determined more by the labor market and access to knowledge spillovers than specific uh, policy initiatives. Although there's certainly also sets of policy initiatives that reinforce those, um, those outcomes. Yeah. 
But these framework conditions are also shaped by policy, but other policy instruments, yeah. Um, so perhaps, uh, Tommy, you were already addressed. I'll come back to you. To you. Yeah, ju just, uh, I, I would echo that. I mean, I think there's been a, a pull. I mean, there may have been local, you know, Massachusetts policies to, that are kind of moderately encouraging the, the process. But if you look at, you know, the West Coast, Boston, in the UK, there's the Golden Triangle between Oxford, Cambridge, and in the in the schools in London. It really is a pull from academics, or the desire to work close to academics. That's really been the, the drive for a lot of companies going there. And and we Pfizer moved to to centres of kind of academic excellence really for that juxtaposition, and it was really driven by access to world leading science. Yep. So perhaps. Uh, turn to the other side to see to which extent, uh, indeed, uh, also from, from your side, you see it's, it's easier to defend uh, parts of the budget that would go to energy or to health or to... Uh, so that mix of different missions, is that something that you can use uh, more easily to defend certain parts of it? Or is it also something that you can use to, to um, have an overall support for, for the budget or not? So this targeted versus non-target, is it, is it a curse or is that a... A blessing. I think it's, uh, of course, a question which is a very natural question. After all, this is public money, so you want to make sure that the use of public money is optimal. The difficulty with this, uh, so in, in actually you are uh, posing the question of impact. So for impact, there are uh, three different uh, difficulties. The first one is the time frame. So it's very well known that for, and it was stressed that uh, for some, uh, um, some um, res res results of research to have an impact, uh, I mean, you, you should not count in years, but in decades. So then it makes the first thing difficult. The second, uh, which is also, uh, I, I think, very um, also embarrassing, is the fact that uh, the impact, uh, uh, if you use impact as a criteria f to, to select the projects, you may actually miss the target because quite often, actually, the biggest impact is done by work, which initially was not intended to deal with this question. And uh, I mean, we have so many examples of this. But then the last point is that it still means that in the case of ERC, which is absolutely not uh, geared toward impact, uh, part of our um, mission as uh, European Research uh, Council is definitely that we should be able to report on the impact afterwards. And knowing that we do it in a difficult situation that, as I said, sometimes the time frame is decades and uh, the only way we can do it is for projects which are finished, which means uh, for, for those we have basically two or three years after their, their end. So it means that the time frame is too short for a number of them to really have an impact. But still, I think we have to organize ourselves to be able to deliver some information on this. And recently, I, I was confronted with this exercise with uh, Vice President Sefcovic because uh, I, I attended in Davos a, a lunch with him. And uh, at some point, uh, we just tried to see at the ERC level whether we have project on energy. And actually, we had 120 projects dealing with energy uh, for 250 million euro, which is not a completely negligible amount of money. And so I. We gathered them and I presented them to, to Vice President Sefcovic. And of course, he was surprised of the number because he thought it would be 10 or 20. 120 starts to be a sizable number. But also what really was striking was the huge diversity of these projects, dealing with uh, many different aspects and many different, uh, even areas you would never think have an impact on energy. So I think uh, making this um, effort of trying to gather information is very important. And I think we should not uh, forget about that. But still keeping the big uh, point that we don't want impact to be a criteria for selection, which is a difficult balance to, to keep. Yeah. I think that's indeed a very important point to make here. Impact is important, but specifically for science, what matters is also to recognize the long-term impact, uh, the riskiness, uh, the, the, the uncertainty, and also the qualitative, non-measurable uh, dimensions of impact, uh, which need to be taken into account. That makes the whole evaluation exercise uh, needs to be really science-specific in that respect. But Kurt, I'm sure you also have some good uh, experience on this that will help in the discussion. Well, uh, a few words, maybe a few comments. Um, contrary to the ERC, other parts of the framework program of Horizon 2020 do have impact as an evaluation criteria. Uh, um, now, if we like it or not, 
um, this question of impact is one that we need to evaluate. If you, as Mr. Bourguignon was saying, if you um, make money, taxpayers' money available for investing in science research and development, you need to make a promise. It's a promise you make. Uh, the question is, how can we frame that understanding of impact? Um, and what we've seen in, the, in the evaluating the framework programs is that it is quite possible and credibly to do it in terms of impact on scientific performance, for example, in terms of publications you get out, etc. That's quite easy to do. What is much more difficult to do beyond the individual projects is the impact in terms of innovation. Because that depends very much, uh, as was already stressed, on the general policy and regulatory framework. It's more than just the funding. Um, we have an ability to look at impacts at project levels. What we don't have yet is to look at impacts in certain areas. For example, beyond one individual project uh, relating to cancer. What difference has the framework program made over the last 10, 15 years for cancer overall? There, that we don't have that. And we're gearing up our capacity now to deal with that kind of uh, impact. We have also just finished um, a, a, an evaluation of the FP7, which has shown that the economic impact um, of uh, the seventh framework program was that for every euro invested, we got 11 euros of economic return, directly and indirectly combined. That's a very macroeconomic uh, assessment, um, which has a base and an evidence. Um, but then people start asking us, well, but how do we see that? Where do, where do we see that? And there, we're still um, empty handed. Um, and that brings me back to the question of evaluating beyond um, individual projects. I'd just like to touch uh, one uh, other aspect, a question that was raised by the colleague from the Space Agency on sectors. Um, I think what we will increasingly try to do is to move beyond individual sectors because we are disciplines, because we know that most of the progress and breakthroughs comes from uh, working at the borderlines between different disciplines, between different sectors. Um, and that's maybe an advantage, uh, but there I'd, I'd be curious to know how you react to this, uh, Jeff, an advantage that we have at European level in Europe now compared to the US. Because we have everything in one big framework program, we should theoretically be able much better to look at this cross-border, cross-sector, cross-disciplinary approaches. The question is, of course, how do you frame that? Uh, beyond simply stating what is a problem or a challenge and uh, what is the goal then. Um, but we also know that one of the problems in Europe is that with the framework program, um, and I, I'm venturing here myself a little bit on risky grounds, is that by working with sectors or individual disciplines, uh, usually my experience, personal experience, is that those sectors um, go more for the incremental business as usual. Uh, um, so if we really want more breakthrough, that's another reason why we need to go beyond individual sectors and look at what is bringing different sectors together or different uh, disciplines. Yep. So that's indeed this other issue of how to mix enough incremental with, with a more breakthrough, drastic risk taking uh, here. Uh, you also raised the challenge of how to uh, better coordinate the different parts of the framework uh, program uh, here. But this issue of, of measuring impact, uh, th that's really a very critical one. And I was actually wondering whether we could uh, draw a bit on, on corporate uh, insights in this, because when you are looking for, for partners in, 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 in science, you are looking at where is the potential impact of the basic science that could be of use for us. So what do you uh, use to assess potential impact when you're looking for partners in basic science? How do you select interesting science partners? And perhaps we can learn a bit from, from that experience here to identify uh, at least characteristics that would predict more likely impact uh, in the short term. Well, I think the short answer is... Um, world leading excellence is really so we, we will look at we'll look at their publication 
the we'll look at the kind of the previous work and how relevant it is. We'll also look at how well connected they are in the in the ecosystem and the part of collaborations that we can further benefit from beyond just the walls of that particular academic establishment. But generally speaking, the short answer is we will look for a definition of research excellence which is usually evidenced by publications and publications in, in major journals, et cetera, especially in the, in the, in the discovery end of, of our business. Um, uh, could I just make a comment on um, the sectoral approach? And, and I'm a fan of the, the cross-sector approach because I think there is a lot of um, cross-learnings that we can get from, from different sectors. What, one of the challenges that we've faced in the past cro in the cross-sector approach is if you take pharma versus, um, I don't know, cosmetics just to play the game, um, then we, we tend to have an IP barrier that is set across pharma pretty consistently. If you then go in to work with um, a cosmetic firm, the value to them is probably in the formulation and how they constitute that. So what they would be willing to share in a partnership versus what pharma are willing to share has a different barrier in terms of um, what they would share with each other. They may share it with us. <laughs> But they may not share it with each other. So there's some challenges at the cross-sectoral approach. And, and there's also some challenges, I think, we're working in industry as to how we best align with the societal challenges to make sure not only we're contributing to the greater good, but also we're getting something back from, from that contribution as well. But overall, I would say the cross-sectoral approach is, is a really helpful way to, to get you know, disruptive um, improvements. So one other issue that was also raised by, by Jeff was actually this whole issue of, of globalization. And in the end, does it matter who is funding the basic science as long as it's funding somewhere? So maybe we should be very happy that the Chinese are now massively pouring public funds in, in science here. Um, but you also raised the issue, is this good or is this bad? Should we be worried or, or, or not here? So perhaps that's also one of the things I'd like to put on the floor too is uh, to which extent, like for instance for you, does it matter where the public science is actually being funded? Uh, how flexible are you? And does it matter for, for us as nations whether you, whether you link to science in China versus science here? Do we need to have the science here in order to benefit as a society? From well, let, let me answer it with different hats because <laughs> I, think there's, I think there's different answers. So, so I, th I think the first level is we will, we will engage the best science wherever the best science happens. Um, so in that regard, clearly Pfizer is a global company and therefore may have a different perspective to a, a more local company, let's say. Ha having said that, I mean, it is interesting. L let me just pick one. Just um, So Ireland, which was formerly, and we know there's a lot of reasons for people getting into Ireland, but Ireland, which was not formally major in pharma, started in manufacturing and is now back engineering into the research space. So to the extent to which, from a kind of macroeconomic level, um, d d does a, what, is the spillover enough? I, d I couldn't answer the question. But, but there does come a point if you don't have, when you get to a tipping point, would, would people invest in anything in that country in terms of what is the necessity to have a skill base, for example, if you don't have an industrial base? So there comes a point that the economics probably start to, to drive themselves. Um, but I, I do think there are elements of our business, certainly in the pharmaceutical world, that are virtuous circles from discovering, from making, from access back to discovery. And once you start breaking the chains, um, you're in danger of losing more than just that part of the chain. To the extent to which national governments need to worry about that, I would leave the experts to decide how, how, what the value proposition is. Yeah. Yeah, perhaps we can turn on the other side of the table to see to which extent there is indeed coordination among, because, I mean, if to which extent are we collaborating with the U.S. Uh, or with uh, China here so that we have a, a global good <laughs> in terms of public funding being uh, coordinated? Would that be a better solution than to always look at it in terms of competition <laughs> and competitiveness? Difficult issue. As you know, for, for a few years, exists now a so-called Global Research Council, which is a structure which brings together funders from all uh, over the world. Uh, now it's uh, more than 60 institutions which are getting together once a year. Every year we have two topics that we uh, try to tackle. Uh, for the moment, this uh, question, uh, the one you, you raised about 
open science in, mm -hmm. in some way, has been only looked at from the point of view of uh, open publication, open access to publications. Of course, the next stage, which is much more serious in terms of competitiveness, has to do with the open sharing of data. And uh, this is not yet on the table. It will come, I'm sure, s sometime. This year, the topics are interdisciplinarity and gender balance uh, for the meeting in Delhi in a, in a month's time or two months' time. So I think uh, definitely some people, uh, and actually the reason why this GRC, Global Research Council, exists is because some people are getting conscious that at some stage you have to address this issue. And uh, of course it's a totally informal structure with uh, no, I mean even the government is extremely light and uh, unstable in some way. Um, but uh, the fact that uh, so people are coming and uh, the people who come are quite busy people shows that uh, there is a feeling that something has to be done there. The way to do it is not yet completely clear. And for I discussed that very specifically with the France Cordova, uh, whether when she comes uh, she feels that she has the, uh, the support or the recommendation from uh, the, the government is not so clear. Actually, so she's even doing it on because she feels she has to be there and to, to know better the landscape and how things happen elsewhere. But this is not yet uh, something which is fully, uh, I mean, uh, some kind of a formal engagement of the governments behind. Maybe that's what we need, that it uh, remains informal at a certain level mm -hmm. and then some solutions could, or some global programs could, could come up. But there are two uh, instances where this was shown to be productive. One has to do with the Ebola uh, crisis, and the new one with Zika showed that a number of countries were able extremely quickly to get together to have some action, and the private sector was also present there for in, in some way, I mean, to accompany this. So it shows that uh, this necessity of being global is recognized, and uh, it does produce some things from very specific situations for the moment. Whether it goes beyond, that remains to be seen. So. Are we, is your opinion on international collaboration, how um, a, a few stepping quick, on the budgets of others? A few <laughs> quick comments. Uh, does it matter if you continue to invest here in science if China is investing and can we not? Yeah. Um, I don't have the economist's answer to this. Um, I have the policymaker answer, and their definitely answer is yes, because there are many other spillovers, spinovers, or spillo spillovers from <laughs> investing yeah. in research and in and, and the skills base was mentioned, the attracting foreign investment was uh, mentioned. Also the fact that uh, you need that kind of investment in science, research, innovation to have an innovative ecosystem from which new companies can start up and scale up. Uh, mm -hmm. So, But investing here doesn't mean that you should not cooperate with the rest of the world. It's not or-or. It's end end. Yep. That's why Mr. Moidas, our commissioner, is putting so much emphasis on openness to the world, the international collaboration. Um, and basically, our mantra is everyone in the world should invest much more in science and development and innovation and work together. Um, and that global cooperation is happening a lot. Um, a relic from my previous position is in, in DG Research is that I'm chairing the Belmont Forum, which is a global forum of funding agencies from G20 countries. Um, NSF is there, Japan, China, India, Brazil, etc. And we are funding agencies that put money together every year in global programs on global change. And for example, last October we launched a new 25 million uh, euro program on managing the nexus food, water, energy in cities. And there we see in an open access format that all these agencies are learning from each other, aligning their programs, and making their researchers work together at global level. And it's a fantastic story. Uh, the Belmont Forum started in 2009 with one uh, program. And now we have something like uh, up to 10 programs uh, looking at these common challenges together. So it's not or-or, it's and-and. Yeah. That's a pretty optimistic perspective. <laughs> so uh, I think we have to, to, to close here, and I would like to give the final uh, words to, to Jeff here. So what have you taken on board from the European experience uh, here? Are you now seeing us more as competitors, or, <laughs> or is it shadow for you? Well, um, 
So what are your so, final uh, so I think, comments uh, and also suggestions for us to do? Oh, gosh. Well, I think that making suggestions would be presumptive uh, on my part, other than to say that I think I now have a number of ideas for research of the kind that I'm more familiar with doing, in which I can pose, question, I can pose some questions based on our discussion today, and perhaps uh, I'll be able to come back in a, in a few years' time and report some specific results from those particular research questions, hopefully with greater positive impact than the America Competes Act had. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. And I think that's indeed something we should keep in mind here. I think we did, it's all about raising the right type of questions, and I think we did a good job uh, here. Uh, so I would like to thank all the participants here for helping in that uh, raising the right questions, and that's the first step to finding the answers here. So thanks, Jean-Pierre, thanks, Kurt, uh, thanks, uh, Tommy, and especially thanks, uh, Jeff, uh, here. And here in Brugge, we are committed to helping uh, to raise, continue to raise these questions uh, here on the table. Uh, so keep us... Uh, Keep an eye on us on which, which are the next events uh, in this uh, to raise questions, but also at least partly try to solve them too. <laughs> Thanks a lot for your uh, participation. Thank you. Thank you.